Okay, everybody, welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. This will be dropping on St. Patrick's Day, and we'll be talking a little bit about whether or not we got dropped a little pot of gold in the market here today. So I'm Justin Nielsen, your host, and joining me as always is Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. Thanks for being here, Arusha. Um, in a little bit, we're also going to bring up Will Rind. He is the founder and CEO of Granite Shares. But before we bring him on, Arusha, let's just do a real quick IBD take on the market because today was potentially an important turn. Yeah. Uh, so, Justin, well, yeah, I, I pulled up the, the S&P 500 here. And with the action, especially after the Fed news, uh, it looks like we're, we're going to get a fall today on the S&P 500. Uh, this would be a day 15 fall today, if I, if I counted correctly. Uh, and so that means that the, we'll shift the market outlook back into a confirmed uptrend. Uh, and, and so now we'll, we'll look for uh, stocks to buy if they're breaking out and start to increase exposure. But all, as always, we slowly move into the market and we let the market prove itself. Right. And just notably, the NASDAQ composite, of course, um, while it did have the percentage change, price percentage change to qualify for a follow through day, the fact that it undercut its February 24th low is what disqualified it from being in the position for a follow through day. So and that's why we're not going to be calling a follow through day on the NASDAQ composite. But the S&P 500 uh, did not undercut that February 24th low. And so that left the rally intact. And it's notable that both of the indexes are now above that 21 day moving average line, yes. a line that was very persistently stubborn in providing resistance. Yeah, yeah. So you know, take what well, we're going to take it day by day. If this rally is uh, turns out to be a real rally and a sustained rally, every few days we'll probably get another opportunity to buy a new stock that's emerging out of a base and it'll give us more reason to get more exposure to the market. And of course, that is the big if, if this is yes. a sustained rally, and that's what we need. So uh, in, in order to kind of dissect this a little bit more, let's go ahead and bring Will Rind on, again, founder and CEO of Granite Shares. Thank you so much for being on the show here today, Will. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so uh, a big day in the market, big, big move, uh, volatile. I mean, at one point, the Dow Jones Industrial Average after the Fed uh, meeting had had turned negative for a little while, and the the indexes had come down quite a bit. Uh, that's, I guess, it's staying in 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 the nature of the market lately with this extra volatility. Uh, what's what's your take on the market right now and where we're at and these last two days, is that enough to convince you that, hey, maybe maybe better times are ahead? Yeah, I think that it's still probably too early to say. However, one thing that I thought was interesting is that, you know, once we had the official confirmation um, of the 25 basis point, you know, interest rate hike, um, that that really set off uh, this sort of explosive move that we saw, particularly in the afternoon, um, here today, and, and really that was reflected in not just you know, the equity market, but in, in other asset classes as well. Um, but I think sometimes it's the actual, you know, the expectation itself that creates the worry. And then when it actually happens, in other words, that the tightening cycle is there, and people get more clarity in terms of uh, further rate hikes, that seems to settle the market and then people have confidence to go in and invest. And it kind of reminds me a lot of the last tightening cycle that we had you know, back in 2015, when, you know, the first rate hike was actually uh, a, a bullish signal, if you will, um, for the market. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about why back in 2015, that was that first rate hike was a bullish signal. Well, I think exactly what um, I've just sort of outlined, which is, you know, what the market doesn't like is uncertainty. Right. And so, you know, uncertainty, you have a huge amount of uncertainty at the moment geopolitically over what's happening in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, before that, you had a huge amount of uncertainty about inflation. We had uh, the VIX, which is obviously the, the so-called fear index or measure of volatility in the market that's been the highest it's been for some time. Um, and so all that creates an environment where investors, the market wants some clarity on where we're going from here. And so I think, you know, there was a huge amount of, of you know, rumor of expectation, perhaps, around uh, the interest rate hikes and whether we would get 
um, a 25 basis point hike or a half a percentage point or even more or none at all. Um, but the fact is that we've got that, uh, the market expected the 25 basis points. That's what we got. Market expected the six hikes for, for the rest of this year. That's what we've got. So I think that provides the clarity and was able then, like you said in the beginning of the segment, um, to allow that um, you know, rally to continue that we saw starting yesterday. Well, and I guess this is where I feel like the Fed and, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, Will. I feel like the Fed is in this impossible position where uh, everyone knows that they, they, they're in a, in a state where they have to raise rates, right? You, you can't just have inflation as high as it's coming in and, and not do anything. And, you know, so many people are pounding the table that they're behind the curve yet again. But then on the other hand, you've got what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, where that's not normally an a, a time period in which you would be tightening monetary policy. So in some ways, uh, it, it almost seemed like this was a, a pretty hawkish kind of tone. But do they give themselves the flexibility to maybe pull back a little bit and you know let let the market reward a, a maybe dovish tone uh, later on down the road in future future meetings? I think this is this is the interesting thing, right? We've gotten so used to having interest rates at these. They were really are abnormally low levels by historical standards. I mean, here's a probably a shocking fact for you, that the last time we had a 7.9% CPI print in America, the Fed funds rate was 13%. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, today we're talking about 25 basis points, or a quarter <laughs> right. of a percent, versus the last time we had inflation this high in the economy, it was 13%. You know, that is a huge difference. And obviously, let everybody make up their their own mind about whether the Fed is behind the curve or not. But I think we've just gotten so used to to these abnormally low interest rates that, you know, even the the mere sort of talk of another quarter of a percentage point, so making a half a percent rise, um, sort of had the market sort of in in jitters. Uh, So it's it's truly extraordinary. But I think, again, it's worth just taking a step back and thinking about the last time we had inflation at such a high rate in the economy um, that interest rates were 13%, not 0.25 basis points. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah a, and, a, and a little bit of the ripping of the Band-Aid off. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and well, so with kind of that confirmation and that uncertainty being removed, are you adjusting your strategy in any way, or are you kind of still approaching the same way that you've been uh, at the, since the beginning of the year? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the, it, it's been a very positive year for us. And, and the reason is because we have a lot of um, interest in the commodity markets. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, gold, other commodities, um, platinum, you know, the, the, the whole lot. So. You know, that's really been the trade of 2022 so far. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we'll see if, if the equity market can, can turn around here and, and stage a, a recovery. But so far, you know, the story of 2022 has been huge rally in commodities and obviously the equity market down year to date. Right. And we'll, we'll definitely be getting a lot more into into that. Our second segment will really dive into, you know, kind of beyond growth and, you know, playing some of these cyclical and uh, commodity names. But I just want to kind of address uh, the underlying strength of today. One of the things that I guess bothered me a little bit is how it seemed like it was a lot of the beaten down stocks that were driving the market higher. So uh, again, we, we've, we talked a lot about the Fed. You know, that was that was one element, one news thing. But uh, to start the day, we, of course, had a lot of talk uh, coming out of China about, you know, what they're going to be doing to kind of support their tech companies, uh, not necessarily be as, as mean as they were, um, and, and also try and support them not getting delisted. So, of course, we had huge moves in a lot of Chinese names. Um, K-Web, which is uh, a, a, an ETF that covers uh, China. Now, that was up 40% today. Um, and, you know, that, that just recovered uh, the last few days of losses. And it's still off, you know, this, almost 70% off its high, uh, you know, after the 40% move today. Um, so you had that. You had uh, Zelensky speaking today, um, you know, to Congress in, in a very heartfelt uh, plea for more help. You had Biden coming out with more measures uh, for, you know, for support, military and humanitarian, humanitarian for uh, Ukraine. Um, so it just seems like there's all of these headlines. I mean, that was just today. 
you know, there's all these headlines. There's this extra volatility. Um, does that does that kind of set the stage for more trouble, I guess, in terms of figuring out a direction when a headline can come out and just put things on its on on its head? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one other headline, which perhaps wasn't nearly as big um, as the ones you just highlighted, was we saw a yield curve inversion right. um, mm-hmm. at the you know, front end or the front end of the curve the first time. And you know, for those of you that know what that means, I mean, typically that's been a pretty reliable indicator um, pre-recession or of a recession, upcoming recession, um, historically. So, you know, that tells me that, you know, the back drop here is that amongst this uncertainty that we're seeing amongst the, the interest rate rises, amongst the war in Ukraine, we are seeing a slowdown. And that's now um, certainly been reflected in the front end uh, of the yield curve with this inversion. So if history is any guide, then that may be the, the indicator that we're going to get a recession at some point. And, and um, are there particular, you know, just just to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper, are there is there a particular spread that you pay the most attention to, or is it the entire, you know, kind of a, a little bit of all of them? It, not so much. I mean, it's more just the basic, um, you know, it, it's just the the fact that a part of the yield curve is inverted, mm-hmm. right. um, really irrespective of kind of what that is. But yes, at the front end, um, you know, I think there's two to ten spread. Um, right. But you know, it, it's really just the fact that it's inverted more than anything. Right. Yeah, I, and and it almost goes to the the original concept that you're talking about, Will, originally, where uh, uncertainty, right? Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that, the yield curve, it's been kind of building this whole time. Will it invert? Will it not? And now maybe you're seeing with some of those spreads, it's uh, you're actually seeing it invert. Maybe that is removing a little bit more of the certainty and uh causing the institutions or some of these larger players to put whatever plan they had in place for that yield inversion that they're starting to enact that. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, it's just another factor to throw into everything that we've already talked yeah. about. But yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I think certainly revival in, in some of these names that, that you talked about, particularly you know, on the Chinese side, uh, you had a lot of, I think it was Goldman, but um, you know, one of the big banks came out just a few days ago, I think you said that the Chinese stocks were uninvestable. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's certainly a relief rally at some level from yeah. that, you know, for the US ADRs. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more, uh, as you said, about this inflationary environment, what that means for the cyclical stocks, the commodity stocks, and how uh, growth investors might need to shift their thinking a little bit. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Advisors and our special guest, Will Rund, founder and CEO of Granite Shares. So, Will, let's uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into what's made your year successful so far. And it's really been uh, outside of growth. It's been these commodity plays, the cyclical plays, uh, not necessarily our type of investing that we usually look at, but hey, that's that's what's been working this year. And if you're not in those areas, uh, you've probably been struggling. So what what do you think is the outlook for the commodity stocks? I mean, we, we've got this inflationary environment. We've got the supply problems that we've had. Now we've got the Russia-Ukraine situation. Um, you know, some of these areas have pulled back a little bit. But what do you think uh, this looks like? How does this play out for the near term? Well, near term, I think things are going to be still quite volatile. And the reason being is because of the situation, not just in Russia and Ukraine, but there's a huge COVID outbreak in China at the moment where you have millions and millions of people that are locked down. And the immediate effect that's had has actually been uh, quite substantial, particularly on the oil market and energy complex, um, because obviously of the the potential for reduced demand. So I, I expect things to be still quite volatile over the short term. 
Longer term, though, this is the thing with commodities, that it's a cyclical and a longer term cyclical business, meaning that, you know, if you have problems today, such as supply problems, whether you're talking about a mine or whether you're talking about um, drilling for oil, it's not something that you can just turn around and fabricate or produce more overnight on a whim. This is something that takes a long, long time to put in more production to address any kind of supply and or demand imbalance. And that's the situation we have right now. We've had decade or so of massive underinvestment, i.e. capital expenditure in the sector. And then this is sort of the, the perfect storm that met, you know, the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic and shut down a lot of production, which only exacerbated the situation. And so coming out of that, um, we had this uh, hugely inflationary situation, which was driven by, you know, a lack of supply facing a huge amount of demand. And then obviously we've flown, thrown literal you know, kind of fuel to that fire um, with what's happening in, in Ukraine at the moment, um, which is really exacerbating uh, the supply chain crisis, in particular when we cut Russia off, you know, from the global commodity market. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could um, dive into this a little bit deeper and we can take it point by point because usually uh, at least the way that you have your commodities separated is um, energy, agriculture and metals. So maybe we take those one by one and, um, you know, you've kind of already addressed a little bit of the, the energy side, but maybe talk a little bit about what, what when you say long term and, and the cycle, um, how long are you talking usually? And where do you think yeah, we, we are in that cycle? So we're, we're talking many years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, typically people talk about a super cycle and a super cycle can be as long as 20 years. Um, but, but the fact is, this is a multi, multi-year process um, because of these factors that I outlined. In other words, it's just not easy to right. generate more production if you want to go and, you know, start a new copper mine. Uh, this is not something that can happen, you know, overnight or even in a short period of time. Um, so it takes a long time to go through these cycles. And that's obviously the cycle, you know, at the lower end of the market, you know, where we have um, a you know, bust situation that we've been in a depressed commodity market environment, you know, over the last few years. Um, but similarly, now we're in a, a very high price or elevated price environment, um, but it will take time for people to produce that uh, or get that production to market. So for for those who are holding some type of commodity stock or an ETF, uh, it, it obviously has had this tremendous run with, uh, you know, due to all, all the conditions that you outlined there. Uh, is, is it a good time for investors to maybe lighten up a little bit and sell into this strength? Or since that this really seems like it's going to last for a while, this, this really kind of uh, shortage, uh, should they just kind of try to ride through it and, and wait for the next leg up? Well, I think people should have an allocation in the portfolio. And there are typically the two reasons why people own commodities. Number one is a hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because every, practically any commodity fund you buy, the main components are going to be energy and agricultural commodities, or in other words, food. And those are some of the main components in the inflation index, particularly CPI. So, Number one, people buy commodities to hedge against inflation. Number two, people buy commodities because they're diversified. In other words, there are different asset class to stocks and bonds. So typically, as in case in point year to date, your stocks are going down in terms of market index, but commodities are, are soaring higher. And typically, the reverse is also true, that an environment where stocks are, are doing really well, you might have commodities not doing well. And so that creates a diversification, which is good for the risk adjusted you know, nature of the portfolio. But I think, you know, my message to people would be, you know, the two different types of commodities. There's the pro cyclical commodities, which are things like the broad commodity index, your energy, your agricultural products, your industrial metals. Those are things that are going to do well as the global economy recovers or as the global economy um, continues to pick up. They're correlated with the business cycle with economic growth. Then you have your counter cyclical commodities, something like gold, for example, which doesn't really have a use in industry. In other words, only about 10% of annual gold supply 
is used for industry. So it's not really correlated with the business cycle with, uh, with GDP so much or, or economic growth as such. It's more of seen as a hedge, a form of money, if you will. Um, and that's something that you know, works nicely in an environment where the market is selling off, where there's a dislocation, a crisis of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um, just real quickly on the on the agriculture side, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, we're not really usually looking at uh, food prices, wheat prices, you know, right. all of these things that, again, have been soaring, especially with the situation in Ukraine, um, given, you know, given their production uh, in that area. Um, but one thing that we have been paying attention a lot to is the fertilizers. Um, does that does that play into your commodity play at all? Because uh, again, this is this is just reminiscent to us of uh, something that happened, you know, a little bit over a decade ago into into 2007. This this move that oil had back then, and the fertilizers. Uh, I remember potash was one of the big big winners there. But you you certainly have these, um, you know, in some ways these shortages, whether it's on on potash or phosphorus, uh, some of these things uh, that that are also. Uh, kind of leading to those supply demand imbalances. Is that something that you're tracking as well? No, absolutely. Because again, that's one of the key things to look for with agricultural commodities. And I guess, you know, really before Russia, Ukraine crisis, I'm not going to say people took it for granted um, because, you know, it is, it is a, it is a commodity it is a resource, but I think it was something that was perhaps not as well, you know, looked at as certainly things like the number of plantings, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of crops being planted in the ground, and of course the weather uh, affecting those particular crops. But you know, now with the impact, you know, Ukraine, big producer of fertilizer, Russia also, Russia um, taking the step of actually banning uh, fertilizer exports. You know, this is a big deal, and so now you have a, a a lack of supply in certainly the wheat market because of what's happening in Ukraine and also in, right. in Russia, but. Again, you throw on the ability the, or the lack of ability for, for farmers to use fertilizer in a way that they have before and, you know, the, the ever increasing volatility of the climate. And you have a situation whereby, you know, prices are obviously elevated, reflecting what's going on. But this is a very dangerous situation because there's a lot of countries around the world that have to import almost 100 percent, if not 100 percent of their grain production. And a lot of those countries, you know, you have um, people that are you know certainly on the on the lower end of the lowest end of the you know economic scale that you know this will be a massive impact um, and you'll you'll certainly have you know civil unrest in a number of countries uh, if grain prices continue to be this high. Yeah, so you you're essentially having uh, these grain prices going, these commodity prices starting to get, get into extreme levels, inflation, uh, you know, get getting to extreme levels, and now the Fed being forced to almost break the cycle to try to bring it down. And a lot of times, you know, when the commodities start running, that's a lot of times closer to the end of that current business cycle. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and like I said, I mean, normally, as they say in the commodity world, the best cure for high prices is high prices. And what that means is that, you know, the laws of supply and demand dictate that when the price is really high, yeah. producers want to produce more because they're getting a fantastic price for their product. Um, mm -hmm. But as, as we've talked about, it, it takes a long time to do that. Um, but if prices keep going up, um, probably the greater risk is the demand destruction. And that's, right. you know, where the yes. consumer, you know, has to substitute or, or can't consume as much as they would have done normally because the price has gotten too high. Well, you know, just speaking of the, the substitution, um, uh, do you ever look at uh, what what substitutions might be in place? You know, whether it's solar energy, uh, you know, we, we started seeing some of the stocks like Solar Edge, you know, moving and, you um, you know, I, I've just been noticing that it seems like a lot of pollution control, you know, uh, that, you know, is there is there renewable energy getting more uh, getting more attention with, you know, oil stocks going up as much as they have been um, and, and coal, you know, coal was having quite a run as well. So is, is that an area that you ever look at as one of those substitutions? Yeah, no, of course. And it always comes up or, or at least, you know, naturally it comes up when energy prices, fossil fuel energy prices are so high. And, you know, you can maybe think about it in terms of gas prices at the pump. And 
you know, we've seen this before where you get a period of very high gas prices, it affects consumer behavior. Consumers don't go and buy the big trucks that they would normally buy if we're in an environment where gas prices are really cheap. So consumer behavior shifts and they go and buy, you know, maybe smaller cars, cars that can do more miles to the gallon, et cetera. And that, and that is definitely something that almost certainly will happen, um, providing that uh, gas prices remain at these levels. But now, obviously, the big thing is you can buy electric cars as well. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a big change in the market, albeit, you know, a lot of those vehicles are at the upper end, you know, price wise. But still, it's something I think that will, will, will shift that transition from people who are already maybe sitting on the fence uh, thinking about that to now, um, you know, transitioning or making the leap uh, to electric. And, and, and speaking of electric cars, you know, one of the, the a number of the stocks that did really well last year because of that growing trend were the the lithium plays like a Livent uh, Corporation or an Albemarle. Could you see those maybe start trend coming back if a number of these other commodities start getting too high and having that price destruction or demand destruction, as you were talking about? Yeah, I think so. And, and another big component in the batteries is nickel. And that's been yes. you know, an incredible story um, where the London Metal Exchange had to shut completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, this goes back to you know, the, the tin crisis, of, I think, in 1985 um, was the last time the, the metal exchange had to actually shut. And so this is a huge deal in the market. And of course, for those that hadn't followed it, um, the price of tin, oh, sorry, the price, excuse me, exploded to the upside um, when the sanctions are put on Russia. Russia's the biggest producer. And of course, this is a vital component for the batteries, um, mm-hmm. particularly in electric vehicles um, and all sorts of other you know, technological applications. Uh, so this caused huge disruption. Um, a lot of brokers, players on the London Metal Exchange, producers that had short positions, uh, largely for hedging purposes, were caught, um, were really caught by surprise. Um, and face huge margin calls, and that that situation hasn't resolved itself, as, you know, to this day. Yeah, it, it seemed like they just basically said, "Oh, we're going to have to just do a big do over here." <laughs> 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 um, but uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the um, the as, as we're talking about these metals. Uh, again, not not all metals are equal, right? Um, some metals are being uh, affected differently than others. Some have a, a lot more of that as you said, the, the industrial application as opposed to the hedge application of like a gold. So what is what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the metals? Um, you know, the, 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 the big ones that we're used to looking at, like aluminum, steel, copper, and, and so on. Well, I think in terms of the, the, the larger metals, you know, that's very much going to be dependent on the outlook for economic growth, right. GDP particularly. So to have a strong copper market, a strong steel market, a strong aluminum market, you need to have economic growth that's growing. And you particularly, you need a strong China because they've been, you know, obviously a huge consumer um, of these particular commodities. So I think providing we're talking about an economic environment, which is still growing, um, I think those metals will grow with it. You know, obviously there's volatility again around the Russia situation, but you know, le- leaving that out for a side and thinking of more longer term, you know, that those metals are very much correlated with the health of the global economy. I think something that on the shorter term nature, something that I've been looking at a lot uh, recently is platinum. And you talk about substitution. What's interesting about that story is palladium price went to an all time high again on the back of the, the Russia Ukraine situation um, because Russia is the biggest producer of palladium and palladium is used right. in catalytic converters, which are the device on your car that clean the emissions from yeah, the engine. And the manu- car manufacturers used palladium or used majority of that palladium because it's been historically a lot cheaper than platinum. And you can substitute one for one uh, for platinum. But with the explosion in the palladium price, you now have palladium, which is almost three times the price of platinum per ounce. Wow. Wow. And so I think on a substitution basis, we're going to see a lot more automakers start to substitute uh, palladium for platinum in catalytic converters and start, you know, feeding into that demand for platinum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What about something like rare earth? Now, uh, and uh, obviously China ha- has a ha- has a lot of uh, access to rare earth, even Russia, but the U.S. doesn't necessarily because they haven't really kind of 
they don't have a lot of minds to to go after that. Could that be something that's uh, affected over the next few years? Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, because these metals are so important yeah. in all the technological products that we know and love and products that we want to build in the future. And so the, the race to, to grab as much of this uh, supply, you know, certainly, in, if you're talking about rare earths, it's certainly at the moment be won by China. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that's going to be hugely important in terms of access to these particular metals. It, it's much harder to invest in them because, you know, the majority of them don't trade, don't have any kind of futures contract or any trade on, on an exchange. Yep. Um, but that being said, you know, clearly companies that are, that are in that business, listed companies in that business do have the potential to do well. Again, as you know, we're in a world, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, technologized, if that's even such a word, um, whereby we're using and consuming more of these metals uh, to make these uh, products that, that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. And then kind of merging uh, a couple of these topics here. Uh, wh what about uranium? You know, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a metal, but you know, this is certainly an energy play. Uh, is that something that you're tracking as well? Yeah, no, I mean, I, again, that's been a huge story. Um, certainly over the last 12 months, um, you know, the prices really performed incredibly well. And again, largely on the back of before uh, anything to do with Ukraine, um, it was the potential for, you know, the, the transition to net zero, the transition from, you know, a fossil fuel based world to one that used renewable fuels. And I think people had really worked out that, that despite, you know, the reservations, the obvious reservations about nuclear, about uranium um, that we've had for decades, that really it couldn't be, it couldn't be a net zero world, uh, a true net zero world, a true green energy world without nuclear being a part of that mix. And so accordingly, uh, uranium has done very well uh, out of that and, and in response to that kind of story. Uh, but again, the, the whole you know, situation with the Russia and Ukraine has, has just added you know, further emphasis or amplitude to that. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Well, when we come back, we're going to dive a little bit more into some of the ways in which granite shares uh, can help investors with some of these commodity plays. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, everybody, and welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Paris and our special guest, Will Ryan from Granite Shares. Uh, Will, let's go ahead and talk about some of the ways in which Granite Shares is helping investors, uh, you know, get into these commodities. And let's go ahead and start with gold. Uh, so let's bring up BAR. Uh, which again, love love the symbol. I always love when ETFs uh, come up with these great symbol names. Um, but you know, gold is really. I mean, if you look at it, it's had this big long base of not doing anything. You know, for for so long, and now it's finally looking uh, looking interesting again. So, uh, is this is this kind of getting into that prior resistance from? Uh, way back when, or is this is this something that could be sustained into a bigger move? And I guess part of that depends on what what happens, right, with with inflation and the economy. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think that one interesting thing that I have found is that uh, typically gold prices uh, take a long time, so they move in long term cycles. In other words, from the peak to the next peak. And so we had an all time high, you know, back then in 2011. Uh, and then we had another all time high in 2020, you know, so roughly a decade between mm -hmm. those peaks. And what we've just seen is basically two years where the gold price sold off after 2020, after we reached that all time high, you know, consolidated uh, for a number of months and then made a recent climb back up to within a breath really of, of the all-time high that we saw in 2020. And another interesting fact is 
when we look at what's happening with interest rate rises, some people may think that rising interest rates is negative for gold. And intuitively, that does make a lot of sense. However, when we look at what's happened, um, particularly in, in prior rate hike uh, situations, what actually happened is the last um, tightening cycle that began in 2015, the, actually the day after the first rate hike was put in place, that represented the bottom mm. of gold in that particular cycle. And the price of gold rallied really up until the peak of uh, that tightening cycle, which was in late 2018. So if history is a guide, then we've had a situation where the last two years we've consolidated um, that all-time high that we saw in 2020. You know, we built up uh, this base to this base that we see um, today. You know, just off of just off of 2000. And now that we've seen the first rate hike announced, and we know what that looks like for the rest of the year, I think we could be in an interesting situation where, again, if history is any guide. This is a bullish thing for gold um, for the next sort of couple of years or so. But, you know, again, we're in unprecedented times. We have inflation, the highest level since the 1970s. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, where else do you go to hedge against these inflationary risks in your portfolio? Yeah, and, and that's interesting because it, it seemed like at least for a few years, uh, maybe, maybe, and this is just just kind of my anecdotal kind of exp, uh, just uh, observations. People were kind of doubting gold, and they were they were almost kind of running towards Bitcoin yeah. uh, as kind of the the new gold, exactly the digital gold in, as the inflation hedge. Uh, but now it seems like gold's kind of taking it over, and, and Bitcoin's a lot more volatile. Have Have you ever compared, you know, between Bitcoin or gold, or you just generally keep them separate? No, absolutely. I mean, it's clearly a, become a huge part of the debate. There's almost no show that I'll go on or no, you know, a media sort of opportunity where it wouldn't be mentioned. Um, yeah. Certainly in the last 12 months or so. Uh, well, I'm glad we did it more. so that we weren't the outlier. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> it, 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 it's hugely topical. However, it's starting to die down because, of course, yeah. Bitcoin hasn't performed. And particularly as an inflation hedge, you know, the Bitcoin bulls, um, would have told you that, yes, absolutely, Bitcoin was an alternative or a better inflation hedge than gold. And, you know, what's happened is the Bitcoin price has dropped you know, from peak to trough of 50 percent, you yeah. know, when we've had this high inflationary environment, you know, as opposed to gold, which has only risen. And I think that um, that makes a lot of sense, that what we've seen is the Bitcoin price is very correlated to risk. In mm -hmm. other words, it's correlated to risk assets as opposed to not correlated, um, which gold is. Um, but I think going back to your point about um, gold prices, another, another thing that I would get asked a lot is, you know, again, in the early months where we had inflation, it was, it was high, but it wasn't as high as what we have today. Um, but it, was maybe, it was maybe 3%, you know, and then we got into the 4%, we got into 5%. And people would say, why is gold not, not up more? Right. And I think at that time, what was happening was gold was transitioning from a crisis hedge, which if much was used for in 2020 when it went to an all-time high to an inflation hedge um, which is the environment obviously we're in now and actually again it's very similar to what happened in the 1970s so the price of gold really traded sideways it didn't do that much for a number of years despite having inflation that started on in again like we had threes fours and five percent etc and it wasn't really till the end or near the end of the 70s where it exploded um, in price actually over for a very short period of time of two years. Um, and so I, I thought that there was a lot of analogies from what happened then to what, hap or what is happening now in that the gold price didn't necessarily react instantly and in a way that people might have thought was more intuitive and indeed stayed sort of rage bound um, for a number of years before. And, and I think the key is, again, the idea of a policy mistake. When, when the market sort of gives up, if you will, on on official monetary policy on the Fed, on, you know, the market breaks effectively. And people have that fear factor, which causes them to go for an asset like gold. And I think that's really, you know, the catalyst that, that drives the accelerationary effect. Mm -hmm. And could you just, um, so, so bar, it, it really is tracking gold itself, um, as opposed that's to right. the gold miners. Um, so uh, is, is there, 
is there a higher risk? I mean, of course, the, the, the miners, a lot of the companies are going to be, you know, kind of using some leverage on things um, and and everything. So do you find that it's better to just stick with the pure play or uh, do you like to dabble in some of the the miners or, again, in the case of energy, the the, the oil drillers yeah. or the U.S. explorers and producers? Um, or is it better to just stick with the pure play? Well, here's what I say. Um, if you're looking to participate in the commodity price, in other words, if you think the price of gold is going up, there's no better way to do that than buying bar or buying a physically backed gold ETF, because that's exactly what it does. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to participate in the rising price of gold and you like a gold mining company, that's completely fine, but that's a very different investment. Right. And the two are not necessarily correlated. In other words, right. if the price of gold goes up 10%, the price of a gold mining company won't necessarily go up 10%. I think as long as people understand that, um, then you know, people have their favorite ways of doing it. And both are fine. Um, but certainly what I would say to people is if you're investing or looking to invest in the commodity price, you have to actually own the commodity. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of commodities, let's go ahead and take a look at COMB, C -O -M -B, which is... Uh, an ETF of yours that uh, tracks commodities. So uh, again, you kind of broke this down into energy, agriculture, and metals. Um, what What is your split in Comb? And, and what are, are you, again, looking at the pure plays there as well? Yeah, absolutely. So there's 23 commodities in there. 23 are the largest, most liquid, most traded commodities in the world. And broadly speaking, there are three different sectors. There's the energy sector, where you're going to find your oils, your natural gases, your gasolines, et cetera. Um, then you have agricultural commodities, which is both soft commodities, um, such as your coffees, your wheats, your sugars, your wheat, um, et cetera, and livestock, uh, so cattle and leave ho lean hogs. And then you have uh, your metals, so both precious metals, gold and silver, and industrial metals, where you have your copper, aluminum, zinc, nickel, et cetera. So 23 commodities in that. Like, think of it as like the S&P 500, but in the commodity world. Mm -hmm. And what is the split, kind of the weighting there? So the weighting will depend on the commodity. But the important thing to note is that it's a diversified index. In other words, there's no one single sector can be more than a third of the index. So okay. energy, for example, cannot be more than a third of that index. And any individual commodity can't be more than 15%. So the idea is that if you get a big outsized move in one of those particular sectors, that the index will rebalance so that you always have that diversified approach. But clearly within that, some particular commodities will have a higher weighting than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the correlation between all, you know, how, how is the correlation between all those commodities, even though they're completely different, I, I would imagine that they all kind of travel in, in the same direction, maybe some obviously go a, a little bit up faster than others. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It depends, obviously, like any correlation depends on the data, yeah. um, and particularly the date or the time that you, the time period that you measure it um, <laughs> over. Um, yeah. I'd say, so very generally speaking, if you're talking about a short term and you're talking about, you know, moves such as we've seen, you know, this year, they're going to be more correlated um, with each other than over the longer term where you have other, you know, more fundamental factors that come into play, such as the that supply and demand for individual commodities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly, again, saw this, this very big move uh, in, in, in the commodities. Uh, you know, you just see week after week after week um, of, of rising prices and then a pretty dramatic uh, drop here lately. Um, again, it's, it's retained the bulk of that. It's not much of a retracement, but still for some people that maybe, got, you know, maybe got excited and were like, oh, well, gosh, I, you know, I have to buy this now because look at how much it's gone up. And, you know, then they turn around and they're down 10%. Um, is, is there any is there any timing mechanisms that you that you look at, or is it just hey, you, you just sit it in there, forget it? It's it's the non correlation uh, that you're going after, uh, or or do you do any like uh, rebalancing? Like okay, it, it gets down to a certain level, and okay, now we have to put more in or take take some off. Um, so I, I mean, I don't, I'm not a market timer, and mm -hmm. you know, I don't profess to know when you know when the best day to to enter the market is or the worst day. Um, but what I'd say is that, you know, remember that commodities are more volatile. Um, however, 
you know, what people do, their clients of ours, et cetera, is dollar cost average. Yeah, right. One way for people that aren't, you know, a hundred percent convinced that, you know, now's the right time or next Thursday is the right time, you know, to enter the market. Um, but yes, I mean, there, there are always going to be situations where, you know, you've had, you've had pretty extreme moves. So for oil to go over a hundred dollars a barrel, um, was a massive move, mm-hmm. what, whatever period you're talking about, but to go up to $135, um, was a huge move. And so, you know, in that there is clearly going to be some pullback, particularly right. uh, in the case of oil around the China news, um, where you have your know, millions of people locked down because of COVID, um, affecting demand. So there are always going to be that, but I think it's way too soon to start saying that um, you know the commodity rally or, or the need for commodities back is is over, um, and you know this is something I think it's going to play out for some time, and you know a lot of investors don't have any real exposure to assets or any assets in the portfolio that can he- help hedge against the effects of inflation, and you know maybe another way to look at it is if you have commodities in your portfolio, then you have a hedge for you know, the inflationary environment and all things being equal, like we've seen this year, your commodities are going to do well, hopefully, if your equities are not doing so well. But think of it also the other way, which is if the commodities are not doing well in your portfolio, you're probably also happy because the bigger part of your portfolio, i.e. Right. the equities, the stocks right. and the bonds, I mean, they're doing really well, and that's the bulk of your portfolio. So, uh, can I ask why why did you put platinum out into kind of its own thing? Um, you know, I, I mean, you certainly mentioned the the whole substitute idea with palladium, um, you know, which which makes sense. But you 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 had this platinum ETF, and and the ticker on this is PLTM. Uh, what made you decide, hey, this is this is important enough? We want we want it to have its own thing, separate separated out like gold. Well, platinum is interesting because. In many ways, it's like a hybrid between a precious metal and an industrial metal. So it has some of the um, qualities of the safe haven qualities, if you will, of gold. In other words, it's used in jewelry. Um, it's historically been you know, very expensive and it has some of those uh, flight to quality type aspects that gold has. But it also has a lot of industrial aspects and industrial aspects, meaning that the vast majority of demand for platinum comes from industry, particularly the auto industry where it's used for catalytic converters. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a hybrid metal, but um, we liked it because we felt like out of the metal complex, the precious metal complex, that one, you know, had some good potential and largely because it'd been undervalued in our opinion, you know, for for a number of years, uh, particularly historically compared to uh, gold and platinum, of course, historically used to trade at quite a significant premium to gold, so much so that it became embedded in the English language, the word platinum, as the subtext was above gold. You know, a right. platinum credit yeah. card was better than a gold credit card mm-hmm. or platinum status, etc. And that all comes from the fact that platinum used to be worth more per ounce than an ounce of gold. And that obviously changed the last few years and platinum trades at a, at a quite significant discount to gold. And so a lot of people that study that ratio um, platinum gold ratio think that uh, if you're a believer in any kind of reversion to the mean that there could be quite a lot of upside in platinum mm-hmm. yeah i mean that makes a, a lot of sense because it is kind of interesting when you when you pull up the the platinum chart right here uh pltm uh it doesn't look like any of the other charts that we've been looking at which are just straight up into new highs and so this might be biding its time maybe the rotation comes towards this uh later in the year mm-hmm yeah, and um, like I said, Russia is the second biggest producer of, of platinum. So certainly if you look at the volume over the last few days, mm-hmm. um, it's in a significant tick up in volume in PLTM. And I think people are starting to realize that, hey, price of palladium has gone to $3,000 an ounce. Price of platinum is still around 1000 Automakers can substitute, but yet Russia is still a big producer. So there's a Russia supply disruption story, as well as an increase in demand story for substitution. And perhaps you know, that's the reason why we've had um, such a huge amount of interest in the last few days in platinum. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to just kind of finish the discussion a little bit outside of the commodity space, which again has is, is been very interesting because it's not our, it's not our typical forte. And uh, again, it's what's been working. But you also have this ETF called XOUT that intrigued me. Can you just describe... Uh, what what that's all about? Yeah, so XOUT or X out, um, as it's 
colloquially called uh, is our large cap US equity ETF. And it's really unique in the sense that what we try and do with XL is focus on avoiding losing stocks as opposed to picking winners. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind it is traditional active managers and the, the whole active industry are focused on picking winners. And we know that, you know, that's very difficult to do to outperform the market consistently over time. Um, the other side of that coin is obviously purely passive, where you accept the average of the good and the bad companies in the market by buying an index um, and you're guaranteed to underperform after fees and taxes are taken into account. Right. So XL is a kind of a hybrid where it sits in the middle and we're trying to offer a solution where we address arguably the biggest flaw of passive investing, which is to buy every company in the market, regardless of whether it's a good or bad company, um, but yet address um, the flaws of traditional active management, whereby we have a disciplined approach that doesn't focus on picking winning stocks, but tries to avoid losers. So think of it as being, it's more important to avoid the next Enron as opposed to find the next Google. And okay. that's the strategy. Uh -huh. and, and how many, how many stocks do you try to XL? So that, that's a great point. We have, we start with 500 in the universe. That's the 500 largest companies by market cap in the U S okay. we score all of those companies. So there's a seven, uh, fundamental criteria that we use to score those companies. And then we eliminate half of them. So we eliminate wow. 250 names for the lowest wow. score. And then that gives you a portfolio of 250 um, that are reweighted on a market cap basis. So the active share is pretty significant, you know, when you're eliminating half of the market, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. And what's your criteria for what is a loser? Is it based on technical action? Is it based on the fundamentals? Is it based on, wow, we've you know, looked at the management and they are terrible? Uh, yeah. what, what, what's, what's your factors that you look at? Yeah, it, it's a quantum mental process. So it's all fundamental factors. So okay. all things like, is a company you know, growing revenue, uh, or, or in our case, is it, is it not growing revenue? Is it meeting or exceeding earnings expectations or you know, drastically underperforming earnings expectations as buying back stock? We have seven criteria uh, mm -hmm. and we blend those all together to create that score. But the idea is it's the reverse of what a traditional stock picker might be doing. So a traditional stock picker might be saying, okay, well, if a company's hiring uh, a bunch of people, then that's a positive sign. And so I'm mostly buy that stock. We look at that signal and say, okay, well, if our company's firing a bunch of people, mm -hmm. that's probably not a good indicator and we don't like the stock. I'm oversimplifying, but, but that's, um, you know, one of the things that we look at. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting idea. And amongst, you know, the crowded space of large cap equity funds, it stands alone in the fact that it's the only fund that's focused on eliminating companies that we think are likely to underperform the market as opposed to trying to pick, you know, the the next superstar. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Will Rind, really want to thank you for coming on and sharing your expertise on commodities and cyclical stocks. Uh, really helps us out to make sense of what's been going on this year because uh, it's certainly been uh, not growth that's been working. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. Um, one of the things I should also mention is that we've been talking a lot about these markets month uh, charts. Uh, that, that's what we've been showing on the video for those of you watching the video. And uh, this is going to be dropping on St. Patrick's Day. There is a St. Patrick's Day special. So Arush, I know you're no longer the manager of Market Smith, but uh, do you have that uh, link that people can try out? Yeah, you, you can go to investors.com slash MS St. Patrick, S-T Patrick. Uh, to go and take advantage of that offer. Perfect. And that is going to wrap it up for us this week. Next week, we're not going to have a guest. It's just going to be our regular old guest, Arusha Paris. Uh, he and I are going to have some wee time, and we'll uh, talk about what's going on in the market and see if this potential follow-through day we saw in the S&P 500 plays out or do we hit resistance. So hope you join us for that. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.